Um, we're here this evening um, to focus on this new publication by Nathan Jurgensen. We're really excited to have him here. Um, it's called The Social Photo on Photography and Social Media. Um, and we have Nathan here and Annabella Pollen. So they'll be having an in conversation this evening. Um, for um, the format for tonight, Nathan's going to speak briefly um, about the book and the content of the book. Um, and Annabella will offer a kind of um, brief kind of talk, almost in conversation with Nathan, the content of the book. Then they'll have an in conversation together and then I'll open to the floor. So please um, do save your comments and questions for discussion afterwards. Um, before introducing the speakers, I'd like to thank Maya Osborne from Verso and Judith as well. Um, and uh, we're really pleased that we could make this happen. Um, John, my colleague, will be coming up from the bookshop and will sell copies of the book. It's, it's really reasonably priced at $12.99. You'll be able to buy the book afterwards, um, and I'm sure Nathan would sign them if you'd like. Um, so now I'll just introduce Nathan and Annabella. Um, Nathan Jurgensen is a social media theorist. Um, he's co-founder and co-chair of the annual Theorizing the Web conference. Um, he's founder and editor-in-chief of, of Real Life magazine, and also editor emeritus at New Inquiry. Um, he's also a sociologist at Snap Incorporated, or formerly Snapchat. Right? Um, so his work, which appears in academic journals and popular outlets, centers on a critique of digital dualism. Um, a phrase he coined to describe the false belief that the internet is a separate virtual sphere or cyberspace. Instead, Nathan approaches digitality as embodied, material, and real. Annabella Pollen is principal lecturer in the School of Humanities at the University of Brighton. Uh, she's working across a range of interests in material and visual culture. Her research areas include mass photography and popular image culture and histories of craft, design, and dress. She's developed projects on historical youth cultures and experiments in living, on silhouette portraits, snapshot photographs, and picture postcards, and on revivalism and utopianism. Um, her publications include Mass Photography, Collective Histories of Everyday Life, and that was published um, in 2015 by Ivy Torres. Um, so we're now going to hand over to Nathan. I'm really looking forward to hearing you speak and to the conversation this evening. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, so I have to admit, right at the start, um, I flew in from Los Angeles, and unfortunately, I got a little bit travel uh, sick. And so I had a very proper um, lecture. I was going to go over some concepts and some things in the books. And uh, so I took a bunch of medicine, and I feel really high and weird, and <laughs> I'm going to academics ramble already, so uh, just throw something at me if I just start rambling. Instead, I think I'm just going to talk maybe a little off the top of my head about um, why I wrote this, where it came from, and, uh, and leave some of the, we'll, I'll put some concepts out there, and then I'm curious what you all think. Uh, feel free to jump in, tell me I'm wrong. Um, I think that'll be fun. Also, I should say that it's uh, interesting, so this, this is the first event I've done for the book, and when I first started writing the book, I was, I guess, going to a lot of uh, events at galleries and in the photo world, and kind of maybe a little upset by how social media was being approached. I wasn't getting a lot of social theory uh, in talking about so how photography operates socially. Um, how just everyday people taking pictures and sharing them wasn't a really big part of what I was seeing. It was really about professional uh, photography. There was a lot of art reading. Um, you know, are the photos that people take on social media good? You know, they obey the rule of thirds or whatever. Uh, and I, I felt like that wasn't appropriate. It was all about, you know, how, well, how do professionals make money on social media? Or, or Instagram makes your photos look so good, what's the point of having my fancy camera? Or, it, it, you know, photojournalism, paparazzi photography, it was very much the professional photography, which is important, um, but it's a pretty small sliver of the photographs uh, that are being made and seen today, or the cultural importance of uh, photographs in our, in our lives, collectively, socially. Um, it, to me, it was almost akin to if, if you wanted to talk about words, you could only do analysis of poetry, right? It had to be an art reading. That'd be really weird if all of your text, textual analyses could only be about poetry. Poetry is a very important thing to talk about, and it should be a sliver. 
Uh, and so I kind of wanted to maybe change a little bit of that trajectory and just talk about social media from a social theory background. Uh, go figure, a sociologist thinks that they have the, the relevant background to talk about this new thing. Um, so I was wondering if the photo world, uh, the gallery world, would be a little bit, um, maybe not like what I was doing, because you're not going to find in the book any images, you're not going to find, I'm not reading images, I'm not uh, doing textual analyses of uh, the grain on a certain filter, there's nothing like that. This is uh, a social, this is a book that's based on social theory, and I'm a sociologist, and kind of the argument that I'm making in the book, and what, I, what I'm calling the social photo, uh, is that the relevant background probably isn't art history as much as it is social theory. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm bringing up here. So to, to back up, uh, when I started writing about photography, um, I was a graduate student at the University of Maryland, which is in Washington, D.C. And, um, and my, my dissertation was about uh, surveillance studies, and basically none of that made it into the book. Um, but they're, usually what I'm doing to procrastinate, writing dissertation is no fun, and you write it for like five people your committee. Uh, and so what you're doing for fun to procrastinate what you should be doing, usually it's probably what you should be doing. And, uh, and I got really interested in these images that I was seeing. This was 2010, late 2010. Uh, people were posting images with Hipstamatic. People remember the Hipstamatic app? Uh, and so there's this really big snowstorm in DC. In fact, it was two of them. It was 30 inches of snow. Um, so what's that, a meter? It's like two, it's like two <laughs> times we got a meter. See, I'm, I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> um, and it just shut the city down. The city doesn't get snow. So I had nothing to do but to uh, you know, read and write. And uh, everyone was posting these p photos of the snow on social media, on Facebook at the time. Uh, and they were using the Hipstamatic app. And kind of made your photos look like they were from you know, 1960s. Like, uh, uh, you, we all remember those. I call them the faux vintage photo. Just people kind of remember that trend. Because uh, then Instagram was also first coming out. And Instagram had really good filters. <laughs> In 2010, so people knew Instagram for more than the social network. Uh, and right, and I was writing this essay about it. I was very interested in these images. And actually, at the last second, I just kind of threw Instagram. This is this new thing. I was like hipstamatic and Instagram, and it turned in Instagram. And everyone called it the Instagram essay. Um, but what I was interested in was the nostalgia, um, not so much the photography. I didn't go into it with an inherent interest in images. But the use of nostalgia, what is this faux vintage photo? Why, why do the photos look like this? Past the obvious answer is that cell phone cameras um, were pretty bad in 2010, and you probably had to do something to the image just to make it look passable on the screen. But why particularly vintage? A lot of different things you could do to the photo. Why do they look vintage? And so I kind of uh, went from there to, think, to thinking about nostalgia and what social media was doing and kind of where I landed with that was that social media gives us uh, a different perspective on the world. Because you can always share. You have a thought, you can tweet it. You see something, you can take a picture. And to me, that was very close to what people call the camera eye, right, a century ago. Um, and if, if you take a lot of pictures, you know what the, the camera eye is. And you spend enough time taking pictures, uh, even when you put the camera down, you see the image. Right? You see the movement, you see the framing, you see the lines, you, you, you're seeing through the mechanism of the camera, even when you don't have the camera uh, with you. Right? And so social media, I felt, was giving us kind of the same thing. We had a Facebook eye or an Instagram eye, uh, that even, even when you're not on the screen, so this is like when people say, oh, you just need to log off. Uh, well, even when you're logged off, you see things and think through these platforms. And uh, so that was, my dissertation was also about this concept of digital dualism. Uh, this is the idea that uh, was mentioned before, that the internet is some, it's like the, it's like the Matrix or Tron, it's this other world, it's cyberspace, it's not real. IRL is this, right? Real. This is real. That's virtual. Uh, and I think that sort of dualistic thinking is, is really problematic in so many ways. And to me, this was a really good example of how the code, how the platform, how the technology had become kind of our own way of thinking, right? It's built into our consciousness. And to me, that's such a great example of how, uh, uh, how technology is embodied, that our eyes have become like these cameras, right? Um, and, and in the same way, the cameras, the cameras on our phone, I mean, the hardware and the software, kind of become more like our eyes. And it's always those, that blending, that mixing of technology and humanity, that's right at those intersections. That's where I usually get most excited. 
uh, how this is virtual, and this is virtual in many ways. The architecture of this room, the fact that your chairs are all pointing this way, that grants me a lot of attention. Right? There's so many ways in which technology, uh, the fact that I'm here has everything to do with the internet. Uh, so many ways that technology has, has made this, uh, has mediated this, and so many ways what happens on the screen uh, is embodied, is real, comprises real people with real politics and emotions, and, and kind of those intersections were, that's where I try to uh, focus my work, and I felt that what people were doing with cameras was maybe the most, I'm gonna say the busiest intersection uh, of the material and, uh, and the technological that I could think of. You know, when I see people, uh, uh, there was something funny happening on the street earlier, and a bunch of people all pulled out their phone, and they you know, kind of had their phones raised and taking a picture, and we've probably seen a lot of op-eds um, about how people aren't living in the moment because they've got their picture out, the camera out, and maybe we'll talk about that. Um, but kind of what I see when a bunch of people at a concert, whatever, uh, all take out their picture, all, all take out their cameras. I, you know, I, I see something a little bit different than it's oh, there's humans interacting with technology. I see the camera as a bit like an eye. Um, it's kind of, an, it's also an eye that speaks. And it's, I think if you were an alien anthropologist, right, you, you came down to the, uh, Earth today, and you saw everybody with their camera phones taking pictures and sending photos back and forth, you would probably see us as having an eye, right, that we keep away, and that we can pull the eye out, and we can have it in our hands, and we can speak with that eye, right? That's kind of what we're doing. And I think that's the image that I always have in my head when I think of people interacting with technology. Uh, it's, it's very much a cyborg vision, if, if you like the work of Donna Haraway. Um, and so I think that's kind of the perspective uh, that I'm basing all of this on, is that's what I was writing about with these vintage photos, that we have this documentary vision. You know, we could always see everything as a potential post. Um, always see the world as a potential photograph, just like the camera I describe. And that's inherently a nostalgic vision, right? Uh, you're always seeing the present as a potential future past, is the way I put it, right? You always see something as it could be recorded for the future. And that was really that era, too, too of 2010, remember Facebook timeline? Um, and we still have that, obviously a lot of social media is still based on that idea of kind of creating this record of yourself and your life. Um, and, then, and then 2012 came around, and I think it was Halloween 2012 when I first noticed people using Snapchat. And uh, Facebook had a copycat of that app called Poke. And it was all disappearing images. It was all ephemeral. And that was, that was really the moment that it hit me that this was a really important topic. Ephemerality, you know, I, I want to think about social media. I want to think about photography. And ephemerality added to photography? Well, not every debate in photography has a new angle, right? I got a bunch of blog posts I can write. Uh, ephemerality added to social media. Everything was assumed to be permanent. We have so many new things to talk about. And so I started writing about that. Um, it turned out I was, wasn't many other people that I was, I was racing. I thought that was the most important thing. Um, it hasn't, I haven't seen a lot of other work on the topic, but uh, at that point, um, I was kind of, I was writing academic articles and essays, and, uh, and then I actually joined, the, joined Snapchat back then. That was in 2013. So I've been with them pretty much since they were very, very small. Uh, and so I've applied a lot of this work that I'm doing both inside academia and outside academia, inside of industry and outside of industry, and that's something that we can talk about uh, here as well. Um, and so just kind of a couple more points to wrap up here. Um, I, do wanna, I do wanna lay the topic of the social photo, and I would love for people to kind of critique, maybe push the edges of that. What am I really saying? I mean, it's, it's a, uh, you know, we can say, so, so we have the term social media. Social media is also kind of a messy term because it's like, what media isn't social? Right? And you should also be thinking immediately when you see that title, you should be like, well, what photography isn't social? Uh, and I think drawing a line around what I mean uh, by that is something I, I wish I, I wanted everyone to poke at. Um, I'm curious about that as well. And I, I try to lay that out in the first half of the book, really what I mean by that. And I have, uh, I'm, if I did a proper presentation, that's what I'd be doing right now. Um, but I'm very simple, uh, short of it, is the idea uh, for me, this is, this is the best way I can think of it. I think what most people are gonna say is it's any photo posted to social media. And I actually think that gets pretty close. Um, though I think we can, there's certainly a lot of traditional photographic practice happens on social media. And I'm not talking about the social photo, I'm talking about images that people who don't consider themselves photographers, is everyday people taking, and taking images and taking them to share them, to send them to somebody, right? Posting them, messaging them. Uh, and some of that behavior existed pre-social media, uh, for sure. I think of Polaroid 
as um, you know, you have the Kodak, Kodak Brownie and a lot of the marketing around that, trying to get everyday people to take pictures, you know, prove it with the Kodak, um, and, and also to share, you know, Kodak would send, because you could get a Brownie with a, with a, you know, a photo book, so you'd have something to display and to show people, and so making sharing uh, images more important, and Polaroid to me is the closest uh, pre-social media history to the social photo, images that oftentimes were taken to be shared. I mean, the camera was basically a toy. You could pass your camera to somebody else. And you wouldn't, in 1970, cameras, you may not just wanted to ha just hand them to somebody. It was a piece of technology that you took pride in knowing how to use, and a Polaroid was a bit of a toy, and it produced images that were close to disposable, right? Uh, and you were sharing them. And I think that's really close to what people are doing on social media. And so to me, the, one of the main components of what makes a photo a social photo is where the, ob the image object itself is merely the means to some other ends, a social ends. Whereas traditional photography, I think far more likely, the, in the actual image object is the ends, right? On social photography, the actual image object is highly disposable, whether it's uh, Snapchat where there's an actual countdown timer or there's ephemerality built in, or the reality of all social photography pretty much is disposable. Like maybe that is sitting in your Instagram profile forever, no one's going back and looking at your photo you posted in 2013. Uh, kind of de facto images were already becoming ephemeral, right? Even if they weren't technically disappearing. Uh, and so it's that image object itself is only, merely a means to the ends of something social, something more discursive. And that's kind of a big component of the first half of the book is understanding social photography less like art history, less like documentation, like I'm creating a record, and much more like talking much more of a discursive act. Uh, so I think to me that, you know, Walter, Walter Benjamin had this really good, uh, has a, a, um, a really good essay called The Storyteller, where he's making this distinction between experience and information. For him, he was talking about how you, uh, in oral cultures, he would tell stories, uh, and then textual cultures. Our modern culture uh, was much more about information, keeping records and stats. And he was saying the storyteller could really get at the poetry, um, the, the experience, the what it's like to have an experience, to really tell, uh, to accurately describe something versus our sort of informational account, uh, which is very accurate, um, but sometimes can't get at certain truths. And I actually thought that was a really good parallel with traditional photography and social photography. Uh, I think a lot of traditional photography focused on, is the image accurate in an informational sense? You know, is, does this accurately and you know, perfectly depict the photons that are in the world they have been captured on my light sensitive uh, uh, film, my chemicals, and that is the image. Uh, whereas with social photography, I think oftentimes people get distracted by questions of truth. Uh, I think it's about capturing the experience. To me, that's the, when I'm talking about the people with the, their eyeballs in their hands, uh, with their phones, I think that is the essence of social photography. You have an experience right now between your ears. Uh, and that what it's like of lived experience, you think, maybe that's something I can share. Maybe that's something I can speak with. And I think right now the camera is one important way we can get at that. And it may not be accurate. Maybe that's something we can talk about. There's a lot of these debates about uh, social media and truth, and social photography and truth. And yeah, it may not be completely objectively accurate to the photons in the world, but you can also speak truths through the creativity of sharing this experience uh, between your ears. And it, it really reorients the kind of uh, questions that we might ask um, of the photograph uh, what does it mean? What makes it good? Right? I'm not talking about a good photograph in the situation, in the, in the social photo situation, isn't necessarily, you know, did it obey the, the, all the, the right uh, uh, artistic uh, merits of photography, but maybe it's something closer to, did you respect people's privacy? Right? Were you funny? Did you communicate what you're experiencing well? Like social goods rather than artistic goods. Um, I can think of many other ways we can go with that, but I, I, I do want to wrap up. Um, uh, and, uh, and thank everyone for uh, coming out tonight, and thank the gallery for inviting me here. And uh, I'm pretty drugged up. I've probably been rambling, so I'm just gonna, <laughs> I have no clue how long I've been talking. It's, a, it's all a blur, uh, so I'm just, I'm just gonna, maybe we'll move on to the conversation. Thank you. to have a conversation with Nathan. I haven't come across Nathan's work until this year, and 
I had no idea what kind of book I was going to be reading and what kind of conversation we were going to be having, but um, I found it's one that has many parallels with the way that I think about photography as well, which is coming at it from a, a historian's point of view, but trying to understand mass photography through various different case studies and ideas. Um, so what I thought I would do is do a kind of 10 minute or so um, lecture where I'm going to talk about some of the kind of moral values that you were describing and how these have played out through some ideas in the media. So um, uh, let's get my notes. So I'm just taking a slightly different tack and a slightly different tone for my 10 minutes. I hope this works for you. So according to Consumer Reports, 1.3 trillion photographs were taken last year and the number seems to rise all the time. I don't know how it's ever quantified, but it keeps going up, as we know. And both popular press commentary and critical uh, cultural critique seems to claim that this is doing us no good. So we are bedeviled by an unprecedented glut of images, is what Joan Pompuberta said. Um, and that's somebody, for all of his innovative arts practice, seems to uphold, from my point of view, rather conventional concerns about there being too many photographs in the world and that that quantity is somehow kind of bad for us. And critics who are operating in that mode have argued that we find ourselves in an era where images are comprehended through the idea of excess, an era in which we speak of the consequences of mass production as asphyxiation rather than emancipation. And the corollary of that excess, so the argument goes, is hypervisibility, it's universal voyeurism, um, it's blindness and insensitivity. Photographic volumes are frequently described as cascades, explosions, swollen rivers, and their effects are often assessed in pathological language as epidemics that can result in vertigo. In fact, to quote your very first page. <laughs> So um, this dystopian view of photography, and I'm not mischaracterising what you're doing, Nathan, as entirely in this mode, but this dystopian view of photographic multiplication that I'm describing and that you can see playing out in the examples behind you is a core anxiety about photography in the popular press as much as it is among kind of uh, cultural critics. critiques. So many articles in the national news media, I'm doing a kind of snapshot of these. It could have gone on for hours. I could have sped them up. There's so many of them. Um, there are many of these hand-wringing articles about the sheer quantity of photographs that are now taken and circulated. And again, emotive terms like flood and tumult are used to evoke a kind of biblical sense of scale, a sense of impending doom. So to offer a quick sample from some of these fairly typical articles, some of which are scrolling behind me, um, a piece in The Guardian entitled The Death of Photography asks, are camera phones destroying an art form? And Stuart Jeffries claims, the journalist who wrote that article, says in his opening statement, quote, the world is now drowning in images. Using a related metaphor, James Estrin, writing for the New York Times, says, we ignore at our peril the tsunami of vernacular photographs, which threaten now to wash away everything in that path going to Canada, so this is everywhere. In the Globe and Mail, journalist and photographic judge Ian Brown gathers around professional photographers and they all worry, they share their fears about the loss of photographic quality, about this rising tide of photographs, about the technological deluge, as it's described, of amateur practice. So this drip, it's described, this kind of drip of um, photography is seen as pathologically persistent and it's described in that article as the visual equivalent of a hypodermic drip. And when Brown asks, why do we take them? He concludes, for the same reasons that addicts are addicted to anything. He says, to kill the pain of awareness, the uncomfortable difficulty of actually seeing. So photography under these conditions is nothing more, as he describes it, as a neurotic form of masturbation fueled by an unstoppable sense of technological entitlement. That's probably my peak bad quote. <laughs> no, maybe not, actually. There may be more. But these apocalyptic claims, you might kind of laugh about them. They could be dismissed as the inflated and attention-seeking clickbait of uh, people seeking headlines. But the point remains, huge quantities of photographs excite fears of unmanageability, incalculability, a loss of value, and a loss of magic. So in 21st century image saturation, the photograph apparently loses that condition 
of exclusive, exquisite object that it once enjoyed. The feeling is that massification trivialises it. Extraordinary experiences are overwhelmed by banal experiences. And that's perhaps no surprise given the shift of photography from a standalone industry to an aspect of a computational network that fears about the declining value of photography mirror contemporaneous concerns about the loss of expertise and quality in an internet age. So there are many books about this too. So an example of that approach, one of many, could be seen in Andrew Keane's book, The Cult of the Amateur, for example. He's a self-styled digital media entrepreneur and he mourns, mourns the loss of culture. He says culture is turning into cacophony through an avalanche of amateur content. He's not necessarily talking about photography. He's talking about the, the internet and its loss of expertise. An assault, he says, that threatens our values, our economy, and ultimately innovation and creativity are itself. Maybe that's my big overblown quote. So this is a rather elitist view, now of digital mass photography, where this secure status of the singular vision of a narrow band of professionals, of photographic heroes, so hard won after so many years of fighting for photography as an art and fighting for it as, um, through its art historical valoration, that's now made insecure. So to continue the popular metaphor, now we have the opening of the photographic floodgates. And whereas once it was the case that large qualities of photographs might only be produced by small groups of professional practitioners, and the public domain of photography was necessarily limited to those with access to publication channels and their gatekeepers. With this radically expanded proliferation of practice in the 21st century and this new means for public circulation, the regular anxieties expressed that there are now too many photographs seem to me that there are too many photographs, people are saying, of the wrong kind. The massification of photography is sometimes linked to a more discomforting critique of photography by the masses. So the mind-boggling scale of photographic practice is one aspect of that anxiety, but the other is the apparent repetitive sameness of the results. That's another theme that comes out through all of these articles. And yet, as I've argued in my own work, in relation to, for example, the sunset as a particularly despised form of photographic cliché, we need to tread carefully when we hear dismissals of popular forms in these terms, and you do this very carefully, I think, Nathan. Who is to say how many photographs are too much? And that some subjects are inherently banal is not an unambiguous fact. So-called clichés tend to be identified by those who wish to communicate distinction. There are appraisals by people in the know. Those who dismiss mass culture in this way tend to consider innovation and originality as the ultimate goals of cultural communication. But that, I think we would probably agree on, is to misunderstand one of the core properties and characteristics of mass photographic practice. That's communication. So repeat patterns exist because they show what matters to people. And in any case, conventional pictorial forms, what photographs are of, do not necessarily signal what photographs are about. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> that's it. Oh, this Matt can't open. I think I might. It's like the end of my slides anyway. I have a little reel of them. Maybe that's it. So, um, massed bodies of photographs may look alike when you're looking from a distance, but up close there's something else. And maybe this is where we have a little bit of difference because I tend to look at the individual photograph as as meaningful as the kind of macro view. But if you're looking only at photographs from a distance, um, these photographs are something rather different. Instead of being examples of cliché, when you look close up, these photographs might be examples of another rhetorical device. So antanaclasis means repetition with significant, with, sorry, repetition with different significations. So many pictures that look alike, but each with, say, different captions. So large bodies of photographs only look the same if you're believing in some such objectified and dehumanised units as the masses, which personally I don't think exist, and if you don't look in detail at any examples or at the reasons why they're taken. So just because there are huge photos of them don't, doesn't mean they don't individually matter. And new visions of new enormities might not preclude old ways of looking that is up close and in detail. 
So popular photography's particular affordances, where they're simultaneously similar and different, produces a productive tension for understanding a form that always oscillates between the mass and the singular, and between the cherished and the despised. So that's my take on it, which is very similar in some ways to some of your things and points, and very different in others. So maybe that's a good segue into having a conversation about, um, about the book. Shall I ping this off, Janice? Shall I press it? Escape? I'll leave it to you. I mentioned about these cascades and so on. That's one of the things I definitely want to talk to you about, this kind of photographic abundance. But one of the first things I want to say is I love the book, <laughs> even though I'm very, very critical. I'm now wearing a badge. I love it that much. Um, it only came out on Tuesday, so maybe no one in the room has even read it yet. But I have to say it's a great book. I'll definitely, definitely be recommending it to students. And in fact, on the back, it says... Nathan Jurgensen is the Susan Sontag of the selfie generation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to use that as my opening question. I'm going to pay for that. I'm going to pay for that so hard. <laughs> I think it's really great that um, you're saying that social theory needs to be a part of the understanding of any sort of social practices in photography. I totally, totally agree. I think it's really important. Um, and we're talking about photographs here as social practices rather, rather than art events, which I also totally agree with, and it's really important. Um, but I wondered whether you actually didn't really like photography. And that's why I thought you might be a little bit similar to Susan Sontag, not just in your brilliant, pithy way of making really complex ideas really um, readable, as she does. But um, I've always thought that Susan Sontag doesn't actually like photography very much. She's sort of that sort of nihilistic kind of... Um, that style of writing where she seems, you know, she's obsessed with it, of course, because she's drilling down into every last detail of it, but she always seems to come out thinking that it's something that's kind of a, a little bit despicable. And, um, you know, photographers are tourists, it's always this kind of surface engagement with the world and so on. And there were a few times where I felt those ideas coming through with you, and I'm just really interested to know about what you think about that. Yeah. What what you think about Susan mm -hmm. Sontag, but... Too, do you actually like photography? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm pretty harsh on the street photographer in the book. Um, but uh, I, would, I would say, so I'm uh, admittedly a tourist uh, visitor in the, in the photo world. My background, again, is sociology. And um, that's, I, I'm not inherently interested in photographs. I'm not inherently interested in cameras uh, and, or tech in general, in all, in all honesty. I'm interested in how people talk. I'm interested in identity. I'm interested in how information and experiences are exchanged, um, uh, and not necessarily the medium or, um, I think a lot of these books tend to be um, the spectacle of technology, right? Like almost like they, they, they want me to have a section at the beginning, well, not Verso, Verso was very nice, but they didn't make me, but most of the books have to have a section at the beginning where, again, get to do, wow people with the numbers, this is how many photos are taken, this is how much of it, whatever company is worth, and. Um, and there, so there is a, a bit of a spectacle to the tech, um, and and also to the images. Like and you're supposed to have a bunch of images in the book, and um, you know I've seen some other books about selfies, and so you just have to put a lot of young women on the cover taking selfies, and that's going to get people um, uh, riled up. And uh, so I think there is some spectacle around uh, the images and the technology. And my my interest is really in people. I'm in, into, into identity and sociality and. Uh, those sorts of things, and I, but I will admit, in my, I tried to catch, I tried to do my research, do my homework on uh, photographic theory and history uh, in writing this book, and there's probably experts in this room will tell me, at best, I probably got halfway there, I don't know, um, but I will admit, I will say that almost all of the books that I've read, I think also disliked photography. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of many. I think Jeff Dyer has a, a catalog of essays on photography. I felt like he was pretty into photography, but I think I, I'm trying to think of, there wasn't, weren't really many books that, uh, especially the ones that I loved the most, um, Jonathan Crary, Jeff, Jeffrey Batchin, Sean Michelle Smith, um, Sontag. I mean, they're, they're all like pretty negative on, on photography. I think I'm a little bit more ambivalent, um, but mm -hmm. I, I, will, I will give the uh, example of the street photographer uh, as something, I, I did come down pretty harsh, and I'm sure some people who, uh, our street photographers uh, will will not like me for that. Um, oh, actually, I'll just say why. So um, 
I use the street photographer in the book. So the first half of the book is kind of what I talked about at the beginning, and I, and I really love your slideshow, um, which kind of gets at the second half of the book, um, where I, I do talk about kind of photo hate and this mm -hmm. idea that we're not in real life and all that. We could talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the first half of the book, I'm using social theory to describe this new thing of the social photo. In the second half of the book, I want to use these those insights about photography and apply them to the world in general and technology in general. So there's sections on identity, on truth, privacy, things like that. Um, and so the privacy one, I, I felt like the street photographer was um, this person who's kind of, I kind of talk about them as the camera mechanism embodied, right? You're on the prowl looking for images and you're kind of looking for the world, seeing the world as something that you can consume, take, right? right? Take a piece of it, a chunk of it, and then use it to, profit, right? Use it to, uh, uh, whether it's just likes and comments and hearts or whatever on, the, on a platform or literally to sell your photos and, and, I've, and oftentimes without consent, right? Uh, and there's you know, endless examples of, of uh, you know, New York Times just ran one of these pieces like the one, is it, you know, they're constantly running this, that yeah. you, and it was just uh, images in the world of people on their phone. It's just the most tired photo project in the world, where you just take pictures of people looking at their phone, and you're like, it's like a like a Banksy thing, where it's like, oh wow, that's so profound, uh, and <laughs> uh, and and it's just the most cliche thing in the world. And then they had a writer in there saying, oh, people don't talk to each other anymore; they're only talking to their phones. And it's like, if you were in that scene, you would see someone; they're probably talking to somebody on their phone. Yeah. And then there's this street photographer, or New York Times creep taking pictures of them without any consent, right? Mm -hmm. These people didn't consent to be in the image. Uh, behind there, also with technology in between them and the world, all in order to take them and their image, to put it in the New York Times, <laughs> to sell copies, and you know, to make the readers feel good about themselves. Oh, I read the newspaper, those people are on the phones. I'm, you know, I, you know, it's a, you know, mm -hmm. sort of a social ranking kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and to me, that was a really good metaphor for tech companies and uh, privacy violations in general, right? This idea of, uh, I'm on the prowl, I see everything that you're doing as data. I can take it, record it, put it in my databases, and then use that to make a profit. And I actually felt like the street photographer at their worst. I know not all street photographers, <laughs> some of them operate very different ethics. Hashtag and, not all street exactly. photographers. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, but isn't that, isn't that very similar to what Silicon Valley, how Silicon Valley sees the world? Um, or some of the worst uh, vlog, you know, like prank vloggers, uh, TikTok, a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a whole genre of media out there where you kind of see people as things to use, capture their image, capture their data, yeah. and put it to use, uh, oftentimes without consent. So, um, and it's really elitist, exactly what you say, so that yeah. person who's got a fancy camera and who has employment on the newspaper can do exactly that, but critique everyone else for doing that same thing. But mm -hmm. I think what's really fresh about your thinking is you're probably the only person who is defending some of the practices that are so commonly, as in those newspaper articles and many, many more, are dismissing. So, you know, the, the holding up the phone at the concert... You, I think you're the only person who's defending that in the world. <laughs> but it's great that you are, because you're saying this is communication, this is engagement. I've seen really, actually, somebody else who does something really interesting, some authors in a book about uh, um, museums and visitor photography have also argued for that being a form of engagement, an extra level of educative, you know, pedagogic Same experience. Either. Yeah, Same yeah, it's really either. interesting, because, you know, you see people doing hashtag museum selfie and the kind of discourses what they're doing, they're not actually experiencing the art on display, they're kind of putting this constant sort of voca, this mediating um, thing that's interrupting real life experience. And there's so many people who dismiss it, and then there's, you know, there's some really fresh thinking coming out, I think, by people who are, maybe you like people. Because you have to kind of think, these people are doing stuff that's important to them, yeah. rather than kind of dismiss a huge, you know, 99% of the world, the people who aren't doing um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the problems with any conversation around tech, it, it feels like, is it the question has to be, is it good or bad? Are you utopian yeah. or dystopian? Yeah, yeah. Um, the approach I take is to be extremely critical of the platforms and the companies, uh, including the one I work for, uh, and uh, but then to extend a lot of empathy to the users. And I think, honestly, a lot of people get that exactly opposite. They get that wrong. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm always interested in how heavy-handed some of these conversations are, like how, like this, oh, it's so, gets so dystopian, right? Yeah. Um, and 
yeah, if you're at a concert, you know, probably turn the brightness down. If you're gonna hold your photo, don't put it above your head. If you do, but do it really quick. Yeah, like those are the things, like just basic decency and basic, like, you know, just like we can figure out what the etiquette is in a situation. Yeah, like if you have a selfie stick, don't do it in a crowded area. <laughs> These sorts of things, like, yeah, I'm not in no way, you know, I've wrote most of the book, like, away from Wi-Fi and connections, I can't really get any writing done. Uh, but, you know, I understand, you know, I understand all of these things. Uh, what I'm interested in is when someone's looking at their phone and then suddenly that crit the, the critique becomes that they're less human, right? Not, not that they turn the brightness down, it's that they're less human. Mm -hmm. uh, very, like, mainstream books in sociology and, uh, you know, guardian op-eds, whatever, um, routinely, you know, I have a list of it in the, in, in the book about how people don't have real selves anymore. Mm. They don't have real, they don't have creativity anymore. They're not real, they're not living in the moment. They don't have the moment, they're not, they're living less. And it's all, it's actually really dehumanizing. Mm. Saying that people are alive less. Like one of the worst things you can do is socially rank people on how more or less human they are because how human someone is determines how much moral regard you offer them, right? Uh, and it's, that's the worst habit in the world. And I think that's really scary, it's really conservative. And you know, I, critique the companies, critique the platforms, but understand what people are doing, understand that they're still human. Like the people who are using their phones are still humans that have emotions and, mm -hmm. and lives and politics and vulnerabilities. And, uh, and so I think that's the kind of empathy I, I try to extend in the mm -hmm. book to the users. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, not to say that phones can never be annoying or cameras you know, taking pictures aren't mm -hmm. annoying, but I, I refuse to say that the people who are who go to a tourist spot and take a picture and don't take some unique picture. I don't. I don't know what picture I could take of the Eiffel Tower that'd be different than uh, that. Uh, that those people are somehow less human. Mm. That they're not having real experiences. Mm. That they're not alive anymore. Um, when when the critique gets that heavy-handed. Yeah. First, I think it's easy to dismiss. Like, uh, ho hopefully, that was somewhat convincing that that's a stupid critique. So then, then the question is, why was it? Why are people so routinely? making that heavy-handed critique. Why is it that when we, as soon as we talk about technology, it has to be the end of the world or, or some utopia is, is coming? Mm -hmm. Why do we see, why do we have these conversations at that level instead of kind of a more, I don't know, mature uh, conversation? I think, I won't go there, but I think that's really mm -hmm. interesting. But I'm so interested in something oh, you I said see. in passing. Can I just, can we bring yeah. in a comment? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was wondering, just because you mentioned it there, and especially because you said you're still having the effects of these drugs, if you could um, tell us more about how evil your employer is. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I mean, uh, I do, I work for Snap Inc., that's Snapchat. Um, I've been there since uh, these six years now. Um, so ever since it was a pretty small company. And uh, luckily, I predate the like communications and legal departments, and also I just get to talk and do what I do. Um, so I try to bring this perspective uh, to the products. Um, coming from academia and um, seeing, I mean, it's just the cliche thing, right? Uh, I, uh, you want to, you know, I'm just critiquing all the companies and yelling out into the void, uh, and having the opportunity to actually work on something and to try to bring some of these thoughts into design, into um, policy, uh, I, I honestly I couldn't pass that up. And I wanted to bring the idea of, you know, I talked about digital dualism a little bit and trying to, and I really saw social media as kind of really trying to create a second life. Of, of you have your data, whatever you're doing, you create a copy of it, and you put it out in the world, and you have a database, and that's all sortable and searchable, and it's up there, and everything is numbers and scores, and you rank it, and I felt that was a really um, awful way of design, a really antisocial way of designing, like how we could use a screen uh, uh, to do this. Um, so that was, um, I, I, I'm a proponent of a different way of designing social media. In fact, a lot of the second half of the book is about that. Um, exactly about how we could maybe do social media a little bit different. Um, and so I try to bring that into actual, into industry as well, and into the things that uh, people are using. And um, I've done that at Snap, and, uh, and you know, quite frankly, we've, uh, it's also been kind of the architect of the way that the rest of social media uh, has uh, followed as well, um, which I'm very happy to see uh, more, uh, less metrics, more ephemerality, kind of the things that I've always been a proponent for have kind of um, become more popular. So. Yeah, uh, I don't, and I didn't answer your question of, of why we're evil. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it would be a little cynical of, for, of me to make the, that, that uh, exact case. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say that, um, 
they, they don't always listen to their sociologist. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I'm, it, it is a for-profit company. Um, no one who picks sociology as their uh, as their career probably should have any uh, should never be listened to when it comes to making a profit. Uh, <laughs> it's not a good money making decision. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean the, but I'll, I think it's good to have that point on the table. And if you hear everything I'm saying through that lens, that's correct. We should. Uh, and uh, I think that's yeah, I think that's important and fair. May I carry on with a few more questions, then we'll open it out to general discussion, because I'm sure lots of people have got lots of things to ask you. I want to know the answer to all those questions as well. Um, you said in passing about how you turned off Wi-Fi and you wrote the book offline, and a, a lot of your, um, a lot of the sort of second part of the book, which is really, really interesting, is about this digital dualism that you've described, where people think that there's a difference between real life and social media. And there's an artificial divide that's created where, you know, real life is authentic and um, first hand and engaged and the internet is mediated and, um, you know, it's, it's all the things that are wrong in the world. And there's a whole load of what you describe as disconnect, disconnectionist punditry of same sorts of people who are writing these opinion columns who are kind of fetishizing this idea of real life, a disconnected life. I mean, for me, it really resonated because I've done some work about something that isn't really to do with photography, but it's to do with kind of utopians of the 1920s trying to get back to the land, some kind of wacky hippies of the sort of the scout movement that went in a strange utopian direction in the 20s. And they were very, very primitivist in their beliefs about everything that was wrong with modernity, and you had to cast off everything of the modern civilised world in order to have this authentic experience. And a hundred years on, those kinds of debates are going on again and again and again. And yet, you turn the internet off to write the book, which I think is a really interesting thing. So I was often interested in your position in this book, because it's not there very often. And you've said just now about, um, you know, we've learned about your role as a sociologist at Snap or Snapchat. But I wondered about your use of social media, because... You've made a great social theory of social media, but how does that actually operate <laughs> on a on a person by person basis for you? I mean, to the point, I don't think that looking at the screen and not looking at the screen is the same thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I I turn the Wi-Fi off when I need to get some work done for sure. Um, the point I'm making in the book is that doesn't make me any more special or real. Right? I'm not a more real person because I turn the Wi-Fi off. I don't get to say that I had a deeper, more true, authentic experience. I think my experiences with a million tabs open and tweeting and you know going back and forth, I think that's a real experience as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm not saying everything is the same, right? Uh -huh. that, that the internet didn't change anything. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying that don't use that to do social ranking, to uh, position yourself and your usage as more real. Uh, everyone else is a robot. I'm having special, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more real and authentic because I'm, you know, staring at a pond or something like that. Uh, and that, that to me is, that makes me really angry. Um, I mean, like you said, like the book, so you go back a hundred years ago and exactly this thing that I'm making was the paradigm of distracted, uh, uh, you know, silly, and, you know, it was especially gendered, right? The idea that a, that a woman was reading a book you know, isn't inside that, it's not domestic, right? It's talking about things that aren't inside the house. This was gonna ruin uh, 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 reproduction. Like literally the fabric of society is gonna go away because of novels. Mm. And, uh, and, the, and of course, people, they weren't talking about novels, they were talking about gender. Uh, and I think, the, I think we're seeing a lot of the same thing. A lot of the reason, all the, the kind of hyperbolic, uh, breathless hate around selfies, for instance, is like usually really, really gendered, right? It's a mm. medium of, vis of, uh, of being visible. Uh, and of course that's going to uh, be gendered and a lot of the critique and the hate and a lot of the things that you're bringing up, they're not really about the phone, they're not really about technology and that's kind of what I'm trying to do in that section of the second half is to, to say that this isn't actually about, I think we can have a mature conversation about technology and when you should, when you want to use the internet to get stuff done, whatever, like that's cool, but instead what we're talking about is who's more real, who's more alive. Uh, and I think it's usually about making the person who's writing that critique or reading that critique and nodding along uh, these sorts of articles is to make yourself feel better, to make yourself feel uh, bigger because throughout all of modernity, in fact, modernity, you can actually probably define modernity as being 
this existential dread of what is real. Am I who am I? Who am I? Am I who I'm supposed to be? Uh, is what is truth? What is real? Right? These are questions that were invented by modernity. Uh, like basically, you know, used, used to be those questions were basically handed to you. Nobody, you couldn't fail to be yourself because your station in life was given. Uh, and then post enlightenment, uh, post secularization, urbanization, globalization, these, all these things become, all these truths become questions. And we've been debating these and looking for ways to, to solve those answers, to solve those questions. Like suddenly, if you could say all of this existential worry about am I real? Are people real? Are they authentic? Or are they posing? Right? Is everyone just performing? Where's the real self? Okay, that's this conversation people have had throughout all of modernity. The moment I tell you, well, actually, all those things are just happening on social media, well, then I've just solved the answer. Just turn off social media, right? And if you don't use social media, you get to go, ah, yes. All those people looking at their phones in the street, they're all automatons. I'm real and I'm special. I'm, had, I'm more in the moment. Uh, and so you, it's, like, it's, it's actually the same thing as that, that tech thinking of I've got the app that's going to solve all your problems. And in this, in this situation, it's, oh, you just you know, close the laptop and you'll be more real. Right? You've, now, now I've solved everything. Uh, and it's completely disingenuous and it's got, not going to work. Um, but so that's usually where I tend to go when I, when I see these, uh, these yeah. articles. I've got one more question for you and then I'm going to let other people ask you questions. Um, and that is the question about um, what you said at the beginning about how you think that the image object is not really that important. It's the practices, it's the communication. And in your book, you're always talking about photography, which is this big, big thing. I mean, where does photography end now anymore? It's not this kind of thing you can draw a black line around and point out and say it's over there. It's this amorphous everywhere in every kind of technology in our everyday life. You describe at one point photography as being a bit like breath there, which I thought was really interesting. But I would argue that the reason that people pick a camera up or they pick their phone up is to take that photo. So for me, the only looking at the kind of big macro practices and not looking at the individual things that make the individual photos is maybe only taking one perspective. Because to me, it seems like those individual images and the reason why people take them and what they mean is like the warp and to the weft of the big kind of social theory. So um, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about that. And it sort of goes down to the fact as well that there's no, not a single photo in the book, which is, I think is a really interesting strategy. It's not even a photo on the cover. There's this lovely, lovely mm -hmm. cover with an etching on it, <laughs> wood engraving on it. So I love the fact that you haven't used them, but I also want to ask, what would real photos, single photos, do to that theory? Does it kind of capsize when you try and apply it back to a single photo? Hmm. Yeah, the, the first version of the cover actually had a, a photo of an eye, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I was like, but it's not about, the, about that specific photo. I don't want to talk about a particular photo and do readings of photos, because if I'm, you know, I'm less, I'm, you know, I'm less interested in Instagram than I am in identity. I'm less interested in Snapchat than I am in ephemerality. And that's the strategy I kind of take in the book or is these, these concepts that um, hopefully we can apply um, to particular photos or to particular platforms or companies. You're gonna find very little, uh, actually a lot of people probably be disappointed when they, when they open the book, they're gonna find very few proper nouns in the book. These sorts of books you're supposed to talk about all the, you know, each section should be a different type of image making practice. Here's the cinematograph, here's the, you know, whatever. All the new, here's the AR, the section, here's the, um, and you're supposed to talk about all the platforms and all the different products. And, uh, and I've kind of skipped all of that. That's, that's, I take the other strategy uh, and uh, uh, thinking about the social practice, practices and hopefully that also allows the book, I don't know if this is exactly answering your question, but hopefully that allows the uh, book to, um, you know, it's a little hard to write about things that are as fast moving as social photography, right? There's every, every week there's a new, thing, uh, new platforms come up with something, uh, you know, no TikTok in there, right? Um, and, uh, I haven't even heard of that, I'm too square. <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. Um, but the, uh, so th I think that, that sort of an approach here is, I, I hope that it can apply to whatever comes in the future, um, because it is kind of zoomed out into these uh, social practices, practices, into the abstract concepts. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no, uh, it's, it's the idea of an eye, right, the, on the cover. I didn't want a specific eye, right? The, a picture of an eye, you know, it's, it, it's, it's racialized, right? Like any picture is going to have, you're going to have the specifics of that eye become really important. And what I like about the icon, right, it's the idea of an eye. It's, 
It's I-ness. Uh, and and I, I really like the I. Um, so I, I cite George Bataille a lot. Uh, and that's the I is kind of a, he's, he's probably the, the social theorist that has influenced me the most. Uh, and uh, he's written about, if you, if, you've known, if you know what he's written about the I, it's, it's a little gross, but um, the, uh, uh, I like the, the idea of, of the icon, because I do think that's very similar to what social photography is. Um, sometimes when you take a picture, uh, it's, it's, I, talk about, I talk about social photography as being like talking, it's discursive. And sometimes when you're taking a picture, it's not about that particular picture. It's not about the, you know, if I take a picture, I live in LA, uh, and, I, and I might take a picture of a palm tree, and I'm not saying, look at that palm tree, look at the detail of that palm tree. Again, this goes back to traditional photography, the object, the information. Uh, and I'm talking about social photography, which is about discourse, it's about the experience. And so what is the palm tree? The palm tree, the palm tree can be like an icon. Uh, so now it's become like palm tree-ness. What am I trying to t say with this palm tree? Uh, and it depends on the person I'm sending it to. Mm -hmm. And it could mean, um, for a lot of people, a palm tree means the weather's nice. It means I'm having a fun time, I'm on vacation, I'm having a relaxing time. Whatever a palm tree might mean to you or whatever you're taking a picture of. Uh, and that's one of the ways, I think that's something that's really different with social photography, that you're using it as a way of expressing an idea. And it's, it's kind of, the object can go, throw, go away because what you're trying to do is say, I have this experience in my head and I want to talk with that experience. Uh, and so I didn't really, I don't usually want to close read individual photos uh, for, just for that in, exact reason. I don't know if that was totally coherent. Um, yeah, no, part no. of it. Let's have some questions <laughs> and some reflections. Yes, how straight up, sir. That was you at the front in the gray t-shirt. Like, yeah. just, yeah. Can, 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 I, can we just do one at the back? Is that the earlier one? Oh, yeah. sorry, I didn't see. Yeah, go ahead. I saw the one at the front because you wanted to show it. Hi, sorry. Hello. Um, so I'm always interested in the relationship between the, the photo itself and the words underneath the photo. I find on Instagram I'm almost ignoring the photograph because I know what I think of it, but I'm looking more to what they thought about it or what they want to tell me about that photo. So I'm just wondering, because as you say, we haven't read the book yet, if you touch on the captions or the relationship between the image and the cap, the, the words, hashtags, and how that leads to following similar hashtags, starting conversations there, um, and how that um, has led to trends or influencers just, ga just gaining more followers? Mm -hmm. um, great yeah. question, thank you. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great topic. I'll, I'll admit that's only very briefly touched on the book, pr probably because I had to draw a pretty, I had, I had to make a scope for this book, right? Um, so even video gets a very small um, uh, section in the book. Um, I'm, I'm really, I wanted to have a, a tight scope and talk about a particular thing, um, but I think you're correct that when we talk about visual communication, visual literacy, visual discourse uh, as we are, it's not just the image, right? It's the caption that's underneath the photo, it's the captions written on the photo, all the stickers, all the things that you could place on a photo. Um, you know, that is expanding exponentially, right? Like with augmented reality and, and with video and stickers and all the things that you're doing now um, that you can do with your phone to say, I want to visually express this moment. Uh, it's far more than just the picture. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I've driven, I've drawn maybe a, maybe a too tight scope uh, around that. And uh, so I think that's really interesting, especially when, you, when you're mentioning the hashtag, kind of the hashtag culture around Instagram, because um, you're trying to game the metrics. Right? When you take a picture and you want to communicate with that picture, it's not just that experience between your head. You might also, you're also thinking about that platform and what works well on that platform. Mm -hmm. And so you, you might be thinking of, you see something in the world and you can almost intuit how many likes it's going to get because the, uh, what, um, what's, what the platform wants you to do becomes now how you see mm -hmm. and how you think. And you can already see, the, you, even when you don't have your phone on you, you can see the hashtags that you would want to use. Uh, and I think that's really interesting and important. And then the last thing I would say is, I do think of that, kind, that is almost a middle point to what, I, what I'm most interested in, which is being able to talk with pictures, not just around pictures, but what happens when we talk with pictures and through pictures. Uh, and what you can, it just kind of is an ideal type of social photography, like a par paradigmatic example. 
uh, of when you don't even need the words. Uh, and something that's, you know, sometimes people call this post-literate. Uh, and so it's not that you're posting a picture and talking around it, but literally the picture is doing the talking uh, for you. I find that really interesting as well. But uh, I, I can't say I, I speak a ton to that. I kind of, I'm speaking around it uh, in the book in the same way that the, the words are speaking around the picture. Yeah. Mm. More questions? Comments? Was there someone yeah. you identified earlier? Yeah, sorry, I thought you were the first one, but I was wrong. So you're the second, but that, that's still, you're still very welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, so you actually just kind of started answering this uh, about what social networks wants. Um, I'm kind of curious in your whole definition of what a social photo is, uh, I just have kind of felt this kind of hole around how these networks shape what kinds of images you might want to share and how if an image is no longer the end and it's a means, who kind of controls what the end is uh, and how does for instance, I mean, on Snapchat, plenty of images that are sent on Snapchat are not actually even what you would even call photographs or images. They just literally are a currency to keep up a snap streak. Sure. And certain kinds of behaviors are being controlled and designed for by these platforms. And I'm curious as to how that kind of factors into the social photo, because it seems to be kind of like you are perhaps the most well-placed sociologist to talk about this. And I, I just kind of have not yet in the 20 pages that I've read, at least. And talk, <laughs> uh, well since sorry about that. I'm, I'm very curious about that. Uh, um, yeah. There, I will, I will say, yeah, within the tech industry, there's not many people um, that do what I do that are in the tech industry at all. Uh, for the most part, if you're going to find a sociologist, they're going to be doing data science. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it's a little depressing. Um, but that, all that said, I think your point is exactly right. If I'm, if I'm saying that what people are doing, it's not about the image object, and they're trying to express what they, what they want to express in their head, uh, and, and people that are taking pictures are, are in the moment, uh, and they, you know, you, you're dealing with the moment by sharing it with people who aren't around you. And I'm, I have, I'm painting this very, very nice picture, uh, but then the platforms have interrupted that sequence with all sorts of incentives that they want people to be more engaged, they want people to open their phone more, uh, want people to take certain types of pictures that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, when you put a whole gamified uh, incentive structure around followers and likes and hearts, I mean, on the, on the Instagram website, when you put your mouse over a picture, picture grays away and the number of hearts comes up, right? Uh, and the moment you put metrics on something, those metrics are probably creating the images more than anything. Uh, you take the pictures that you know will do well, and those metrics go from a measurement to something that actually causes uh, you to do things. Uh, and the streaks, I think, is another good example. If, somebody just if you're just taking a picture of the floor to keep this, make this number bigger, that doesn't sound like what I'm talking about at all. Um, and so I think in, in many, those are really good examples of sort of anti-social photography uh, in a way. And uh, so I think that's a really important critique. And I think social photography at its best doesn't ha has fewer of those. Uh, there's no such thing as um, a platform that doesn't mediate in any way. Every platform has affordances. Uh, um, you know what they what they sort of want you to do or discourage you from doing uh, affordances. Um, and I would say as a historian, yeah. it always was that way. Every technology, oh, every camera technology, every means of presenting the photograph always shaped the photographs that were produced yeah. to be shown. Which so. means, and they also, which also, like we can get a little bit deeper with this, is that it also, if it changes the pictures you you produce, it also is then changing the way you see the world as a potential picture. Um, and for social media, that could be a potential thought, a potential how, how you talk to people, and that the platforms and the particular decisions they're making are down into our conscious awareness, right? Like, uh, I, so I think, to me, that's a, it's a more profound critique than I think you're even making it out to be, and I think that's, that's where, when we talk about critiquing social media, I remember, remember your slideshow, your great slideshow, that to me is where our critique should be, and it should probably be a lot more pointed at the platforms and a little bit less uh, unlike the, that slideshow, which is kind of more critiquing uh, people for talking to their friends. More questions, please. Excellent. Hi. Um, another question about definitions. Uh, and I was wondering how, uh, not in terms of the social, the social media being a mean to an end, but in terms of the image object itself, because as well as sharing images of things in the world, people share uh, memes or motivational quotes or highly altered or images from films, did you have to extend your own definition to include those things at all, or were you not 
um, visiting those? Yeah, I think I think they're definitely part of a larger visual literacy or um, kind of the visual discourse. I think that people are um, becoming very literate in, right? Uh, and being able to, so memes, memes uh, and emojis, um, augmented reality objects to quotes to, to I incorporating text and images together. They're all kind of a, a part of this expanding set of visual literacy. And I'm, I'm very interested in the camera and how people are doing it, you know, mostly interested in the camera and how people are doing it in the camera. But um, that is part of, I think, this larger umbrella of visual literacy where people, you see things in the world and you understand how to speak through them. Um, that's something that, that memes, I think, are probably the, the best example of uh, being able to see a, a clip in a movie and be able to pull that, the idea of what that is, the feeling that it evokes, which may have nothing to do with its actual like, plot in the movie, and to be able to take that feeling, identify the feeling with what you're feeling, and then be able to express that visually, and then according to the platform's affordances and what does well on the platform. Um, I, think that's, uh, I think that's definitely part of, social photography is a part of that, but I don't think it's the whole of that. Uh, and so again, I'm trying to be precise with where I'm drawing the, the, the scope of, of my work here. And I would, I, there is some really good work, uh, at least within sociology that I know on that. And I hope that what I'm doing fits into that, but I don't, uh, I, won't, I won't claim that I've done that entire, like it's a very big, I think visual discourse, or the way that you think and express visually is a very, very big topic. And I, I don't wanna pretend that I'm hitting on every, you know, I'm an expert on every part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and actually one last point, so I think that's where both your questions align too. Um, when I'm saying that, uh, with social photography, you know, photography is social to the extent that the, uh, it, it's not as about the object, but the object is a means to the ends of, of discourse and communication. Um, I do want to say that from the perspective of the platforms, that's not at all with us. So it's actually pretty much the opposite. I think a lot of the platforms really don't care what is happening at a social level. Uh, they care about the information. Right? You want to have that information, uh, be it because you're keeping track of it, you want to create a social graph, you want to use information how people are moving around, what they're taking pictures of. To the, for the platforms, it's oftentimes, it's, these things are just the object, they're just the information. Uh, so I, I just want to be careful on that, on that point, that I'm talking about from us as a social practice, uh, information uh, is not, not an informational object. There was a question down here, I've got one up there as well, so maybe this one next, yeah. Or there's a few, sorry. Uh, thanks, Nathan, for your talk, and especially your <clears throat> much-needed uh, critique of photography institutions, as someone who works in one. Um, <laughs> and I do think you're, you nailed it with, you know, photography, there is art or photojournalism. And, um, but I didn't, perhaps you didn't go far enough in terms of the way you were thinking about the liberatory potential of audience. They're not zombies, they're actually, um, and shouldn't just be treated as humans, but actually as a new, as, as a hugely important side of expertise in network culture about photography that institutions overlook and kind of can bring in a more dialogic way into their programming. But my question actually was, um, uh, you know, this idea of the social photo, and we've touched on it already, hasn't photography always been social? I mean, if you think about Pierre Bourdieu and other, Don Slater, um, where photography, it's not, it's not just about the pictures, right? Um, and, you know, there's other kind of selective histories of photography, um, maybe from science and technology studies, media studies, software studies that are really crucial to this, and I think some of the discussions we've had have been, you know, pointing to communities of capitalism, Jenny Dean, and those sorts of theorists, which, you know, are familiar to photography theorists, maybe, perhaps, uh, and I was also thinking Flusa here as well, um, so maybe put down the Jeff Dyer. <laughs> yeah, no, we should all put, maybe we should all put down the Jeff Dyer, I yeah. don't know, that might be controversial, but, and, and <laughs> following from that, um, um, uh, you know, this, this, if we take this idea of photography always being social, where is the social, where is the boundary of the social and the social photo photograph, and, and you invoke sociology in that, which is really crucial discipline to thinking about that, um, where do you stand then about um, another field of photography, which is possibly even more huge and massive, um, which is photography produced by machines for other machines, um, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, um, so, the human. yeah, Joanna Zelinska, I believe mm -hmm. is her name. She wrote the Non-Human Photography book that came out last year, I want to say, mm -hmm. uh, and which I was, was amazing. I love that book. In fact, if there's a recent book that I feel like I would pair with mine, I would suggest that one. 
Um, and, and maybe a, and a third one would be, uh, there's a recent history of a postcard, uh, uh, picturing the postcard. Oh, I'm forgetting the author's name. Uh, it's called Picturing the Postcard. It's a really good book. Uh, but it also it, it touches on the first part of your question as well. Um, and uh, so to, uh, to that point of, like, yeah, I'm talking about the social photo as a practice, not as a new thing that happened on social media. Um, though I think it's a very, it's this cultural centrality of photographs right now, I think, sit um, in the usage on social media. Uh, and, but it is a practice, and it's a practice that goes all the way back. And I think it's the same critique you could give to the term social media, what media was a social, uh, but there is, and, I, and I, I'm very open to um, uh, uh, how, how has photography been social in the past? And, and I do give examples of the, of the uh, Kodak Brownie camera and the Polaroid. And um, if, uh, if the postcard book came out early enough, I was already done with this book, I would have had a section in there um, about how the postcard was uh, doing something very similar to what social photography does today. And all the, and she goes through in this book all the critiques of the postcard about how people were going to places just to get the postcard and not even seeing anything. It is exactly the same critiques, it is exactly the same stuff. Uh, so this, all these, these his, this, all this stuff has a long history, and I think that throws a lot of much needed cold water onto um, uh, some of the, the breathlessness uh, in the conversation around social media and photography. And I'm trying to remember the first part of your question. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it was more... Uh, oh, the audience. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, the gallery should take more. Yes, yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's such a, a, a wonderful point that sometimes people miss. I mean, most pictures are taken today because you have a more accessible audience, right? You, you, would ne you probably would never take a picture of your latte if you didn't have an audience to send that to, right? You would never take that picture. But now you can send that and somebody and say like, hey, I'm at the coffee shop, I'm at the cafe, I'm um, having a relaxing morning, whatever you mean, right, using that coffee cup as an icon, uh, and you would not do that without an audience. So a lot of times people say people take more pictures today because the cameras are smaller or that, you know, digital film, right, you can take as many pictures, it's cheap. No, we've had very cheap, very small cameras for a really long time. Uh, the reason why people are taking so much more photos today is because of the audience, the audience that the social platforms uh, give you. And so, you know, when I think of the word camera, I don't think of the actual, like, hardware mechanism. I don't, uh, to me, that's a very insignificant minor component of a camera. I'm sure if you're Apple, you're selling, you want to sell that thing, you want to say how great it is. Uh, but, you know, a camera is the mechanism by which you transmit the visual into, into something. Uh, and, the, and the software, the, the, social, the internet connection, all the things that you can do to the picture uh, has far more uh, um, impact on what picture you take, why you take it, the social importance, cultural importance of photography than that hardware camera. Uh, and so I just think that's a, just a dovetail. Uh, I think when I think of the camera, you, you have to think of that whole assemblage mm -hmm. uh, from the hardware, which to me is a minor component, to the software, which is why we take what we take and what it means is probably coming from the internet connection, from the software, that you could add a dog ear to your face, dog ears to your face is probably going to change photography more than adding a few extra megapixels onto the hardware camera. Uh, so yeah, I, I have a little section on the social camera, um, and uh, but, yeah, argument, I think the audience is just should yeah, be front and center. Yeah. To analyze in the round, to think about the audience, to think about the cameras, think about technologies, think about the users, think about the pictures. All these things have to be kind of taken in the round, don't they, for the maximum meaning to be ascertained? I think. But there's another question. There was a question down here, yeah. Um, I, I was really surprised to read that Instagram is trialing hiding the number of likes mm. that you get. That is a, it's a test going on right now for a yeah. small number of users Be in Canada. Because um, for me, like the social media and social photo is, is so much about self-validation and identity. So I just wonder what, what your response was to that announcement yeah. by Instagram. I, I hope they do it. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, for the platforms, it's uh, also a financial decision. Uh -huh. And But just from a social perspective, to the degree, I think anytime you put a number or a score on something, you've gamified it. You've turned it into a game, and anything that's a game will be gamed, right? And uh, the, the pictures we take uh, off will then be in order to maximize those numbers. I mean, that's a, that's a really big part of 
you know, I, I hope in the future we see Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all that sort of, the current versions of it that have all these likes and scores. I hope that one day we just call them social game networks, right? They're games yeah, at the end of the day. Fun. It's, and it is yeah. fun, and games are fun. I'm not saying they're bad. I don't think the whole of our social experience should be run through gamified platforms. Uh, at the same time, I think they have, they serve their purpose. I think it's a fun thing, and we should call them social game network, but to, you know, how you're talking to your mom, uh, probably shouldn't have scores. Like, if you're having a conversation with your friend, like, like, if you're having a conversation with your friend, could you imagine if everyone in the room put a score on each of your sentences? You would have a really shitty conversation, and that's, that's Twitter. And then they're, they're scratching their heads, right? They're scratching their head going, why, you know, why, why does everyone hate Twitter? Why is it just, why is this such a, a clown car, and they and it's like you've put a score on every single thing. Of course, that's what's gonna happen. You've game, you, everyone's gaming it because you've gamified it. Anytime you put a score on something, it's just that game. Um, and I again, games are fun. They should have their place. We shouldn't. You can't take public like, civil discourse and then run it through that mechanism and expect anything other than what we've gotten. Um, so I've always been. Uh, for many years now, I've been a big proponent of not having metrics. I think they're the number one thing that uh, makes social media antisocial. Um, they're very good for engagement, which means very good for selling more ads and making more money if you're the platform. Um, and I would be very, very excited if the platforms uh, removed them. Uh, that would that'd be great. Uh, that was, this is something I've always been a proponent of with Snap. Uh, and um, if, if other platforms copy that, I think that would be really wonderful. I have no idea if that's good or bad business for us, but I think it'd be good for the world. Um, and yeah, that's, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> we have time for one final it's question. Wait, we have at the back. Yeah, we're going to go back. Hi there. It's more of a comment rather than a question. Um, on hiding the metrics, because um, at the moment, especially if we look at um, spread of misinformation on platforms like Twitter and Facebook, the only way for journalists and academics to basically assess this and see how far something spreads it is through publicly scraping these metrics and, and looking at these numbers. And if they suddenly become hidden and are no longer accessible to basically the wider research and journalistic community, I think that would make it really difficult for us to understand what is going on, especially if platforms like Facebook and Twitter are not really giving access to these metrics that they have on the kind of back end. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, yeah, that's a good comment, and I want to. I don't really have an answer for that as much as I think it brings up maybe one other angle that we haven't uh, talked a lot about today. Is is I think that's one of the things that people have identified with social photography oftentimes is like around truth. Mm -hmm. You mentioned misinformation. Um, and I think people are really, I've seen many of these same articles that are saying, well, there's no more truth anymore because like phot phot photography has no relation to the real anymore. Uh, with digital photographs, right, there's no, it's not a photon from the world hitting chemicals, right? Every single digital photograph is being invented, right? Um, much like the image of the black hole, right? It's lots of things are happening to come up with an approximation. Uh, there is no necessary correlation between the world and a, and a digital image. And then a, when a digital image isn't being called up, it actually doesn't exist really anywhere in its image form. Uh, and so it's led some people into some pretty, uh, and then seeing all this augmented reality, seeing uh, how, how easy deep fakes, right? Um, it's kind of part of that bigger meme that everything on the internet is fake. Uh, and I think people have really like used the social photograph as a way of like, there's no truth anymore. Like there's nothing that can be validated. Uh, I, I, again, throw a little cold water on that in the book, um, kind of talking about, you know, first, a more expressive, manipulable photo can express truths that a purely informational, objective one, not that, that that's ever possible, ever could. Uh, so there's all sorts of truths on how you're feeling and what you're experiencing that manipulation, I think, allows um, that I think, I don't understand why people miss that. Uh, and then also just from that, like, photo, photo journalistic perspective, the social photo in many ways tells truths that I don't think we could have, could have been told before. Um, the, so I think of, there was, in the United States we have constant big shootings, uh, and uh, there was a recent one in Las Vegas where it was a concert and someone was up in the hotel mm -hmm. firing in the crowd, yeah. and um, people already had their, you know, already thinking about photographs, you had a concert, you're having fun outside, and then so there's, there's hundreds of videos and photos being taken during the shooting. There was a guy who was up in the window and he was shooting into the crowd and people were hiding and running. Um, and what's interesting is that in this age where people say you can't trust any image anymore, 
Uh, no one doubted the truth of those videos or photos. No one doubted that that event took place and that those videos and photos approximated what it was like to be in that event. Unlike a lot of early, the moon landing or the Zapruder film, uh, John F. Kennedy getting shot, where people constantly debate uh, the ac accuracy of that. So why is it that in this age where it's so easy to manipulate images, a couple clicks on your phone, Snapchat makes it really easy, right? Uh, why is it that we're trusting and believing that more? It's because the same technology that makes it easy to uh, change, to edit and manipulate the photo, digitality, also is the same technology that allows everyone to be taking a video at the same time. And the reality is that not everybody, all these people who don't know each other, they're not all gonna fake it in the same way. And so we have more images from different angles being taken. And take, even though any individual one of those is more likely to be false or manipulated in some way, taken together, suddenly we have a situation where the cameras are telling more truth than they could have before. Uh, and so, I don't know, I don't mean, mean for this to be like, a, that'd be like a knockdown debate, like cameras are more or less truthful or whatever, uh, but just to kind of um, you know, scratch at some of the topics here around photography and truth, and I don't think that truth is, is going away. Um, I think we can be creative when, when we're thinking about the camera phones, uh, how photography is, how it's relating to truth, and that social photography has a really uncomfortable and weird relation to truth. Uh, makes it like the history of photography, mm -hmm. uh, as people who study the history of photography know. Thank you. Nathan and Annabelle, thank you so much for being here tonight. You can buy the book just outside the door here uh, for $12.99, and I'm sure Nathan will sign it for you. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for being here tonight, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening.